Our next panel is on uh, education and STEM advances. And I think we have an excellent panel here for, for you to listen to. And Bonnie Dunbar is going to be the moderator. Uh, of course, education is a critical problem here in this country and probably in other countries around the world. Uh, getting young people interested in engineering and science is, I think, critical, critical if we're really going to ex do space exploration because it's the young people, I think, that are going to make the difference and bring the new ideas and new thoughts in. Just as uh, Glenn Lonnie said, uh, looking back at Apollo, the average age was 27 years old in the control center. And right now, if you look at the average age at Houston it's in, uh, at the Johnson Space Center, it's probably 50. Uh, so uh, as we look to the future, education is going to be the only thing that's going to change that and getting the young people excited and interested in space exploration and solving the, the problems that need to be solved in this world. So let me turn over to Bonnie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abbey. And again, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've had the opportunity to uh, chair the Education Committee, usually with uh, Carl Deutsch from Canada. He's not able to join us today, where we bring together some panelists to share their ideas and thoughts on uh, education, uh, both formal and informal. Informal that can be outside of the academic or the K-12 environment. But we're looking for success stories, and we're looking for ideas. Uh, so instead of uh, Tony Antonelli today, we've recruited a, a, an astronaut who's gone into academia, had a very storied career, and is at MIT, and they'll each uh, talk a little bit later after I introduce them. Uh, Jeff Hoffman. Uh, next to him is uh, Dr. Linda Godwin. Dr. Hoffman uh, was an astronomer. Uh, Linda, I'm trying to remember what you majored in. Um, it was materials. Materials. Yeah, physics. Physics. You could talk about it a little bit later. Uh, also an experienced astronaut. From the Institute of Biomedical Problems, we have Elena Formina. Uh, from the University of College London, uh, with his uh, extraordinary radio voice, we have Kevin Fong. <laughs> from the University of Illinois, uh, my competitor on putting a student, student project on the moon, Mike Limbeck. Uh, next to him, uh, one of my former crewmates on STS-89, Salajan Sharpov, cosmonaut. Uh, next to him from the Canadian Space Agency, Isabel Tremblay. And on the end, another former astronaut, uh, Steve Robinson, uh, who is one of, I'm, I'm very happy to see a number of retired astronauts move into academia where we can help educate the next generation. So the process we're going to use today is to start uh, with Jeff, take five minutes or so, just a little bit of background, and then pick any one of the topics or, or another topic that's listed on this session. And let's hear your thoughts on successes uh, for education, for international education, uh, or the concerns that might be out there. We've talk, we talk about those often as well. We have a working group that will be meeting uh, later today and, and out briefing tomorrow. It's working group C. So if anyone is interested in joining us uh, in the, a more formal discussion later on, uh, you will be asked to, to go to a particular room for, for uh, Group C. So Jeff, start with you. Okay, uh, yeah, I started life actually uh, with a doctorate in astrophysics and I was working at MIT doing X-ray astronomy, figuring that's what, how I was gonna spend my life when the space shuttle came along and uh, with a crew of seven and only the requirement for two pilots really opened things up for scientists, engineers, medical doctors, and of course that changed my life. Um, while I was at NASA, uh, I actually had always been interested in, in education, so uh, I actually worked with uh, the educational uh, video people and, and made about five different educational videos. Uh, about various aspects of space flight. Um, and now back at MIT, um, <clears throat> in addition to my regular teaching, I have uh, gotten involved with uh, online education, uh, the MOOCs. And I have uh, done two MOOCs, um, one of which an introduction to aerospace engineering and human space flight. And that's had about 38,000 students so far, which is a lot more than I'll ever teach in person. 
and uh, and then another course on engineering the space shuttle, which is actually running now as we speak. It's great to do an online course because it let, allows me to travel while the course is going on. Um, I'm going to talk about spheres and, and other hands-on activities, but first just to comment on the stimulating interest in science and, and engineering education. As far as what we can do in the space uh, area, the answer is clear. Do exciting stuff. I mean, when you, when you talk to the generation of scientists and engineers my age now who are nearing or have already reached retirement and you ask, you know, what got you interested, you know, overwhelmingly, it was Apollo. That's what got people exciting, uh, excited. Um, now, I know we've heard a lot here. We are doing, from our point of view, a lot of exciting stuff on the space station, but it doesn't get through to the public. If I hope, you know, we can go back to the moon and, and get uh, really do exciting stuff, that's what's going to attract the students. I know among our students who go to work for NASA, overwhelmingly uh, we're sending people to Jet Propulsion Lab because that's where the missions are actually happening now, um, the new stuff that's going on. The thing that excites students the most is the feeling that they can somehow reach up and touch space to do something that's going up into space. When I was a graduate student, my thesis was launching uh, telescopes in high altitude balloons and then I use sounding rockets and then you know the the number of balloons and sounding rocket opportunities went way down and and for a generation we were really really concerned how are we going to train the next generation of students because you know we're building these great satellites the Hubble telescope and so on but you got to start with something small that problem I think has been solved with CubeSats and and there's no question that that now, you know, high school students can build CubeSats, and, and the more support we can get, and NASA has been great from that point of view of making it possible to launch CubeSats and, and to use the space station for educational purposes. And so I'll, I'll just finish by, by talking a little bit about SPHERES. Just for curiosity, how many people here are aware of what SPHERES is? About half. So it started out as a capstone project for uh, the MIT a senior aerospace engineering class. Um, my colleague Dave Miller showed a video clip of from the first Star Wars movie of, of uh, you know, Luke uh, with his lightsaber fighting those little spheres that were moving around. And he said to the students, I want you to design me something like that. And, and it, it ended up uh, with a, an actual flight on the KC-135 where the students literally got to see the fruits of their labors. At that point, it was turned over to some graduate students and eventually to uh, Payload Systems, which was a, a local uh, company that could make space hardware. And um, it's been up on the space station for, gosh, 15 years, I think, and, and not only has it been used, originally it was designed um, as a test bed for um, on-orbit maneuvering for, for testing various types of, of control laws and, and the like, but um, we, we got the idea of turning it into an educational activity, and so every year for, I think, over 10 years now, there has been a, we called it zero robotics, an homage to first robotics, but the idea that it's being done in zero gravity. And the idea is that stu we, would, we would set a, a, make it into a contest of some sort where you'd have one sphere uh, competing against the other and one team would program one of the spheres and the other team would program another. And of course, we couldn't have hundreds of, of schools programming up in the station, so we, the, the preliminary rounds were all done uh, virtually in simulations, and then the winners would get invited to MIT, and they'd actually, there would be an astronaut, it was well supported by NASA, there'd be an astronaut who would load their programs onto each of the spheres, and then, and then they would actually compete. 
It was amazing. I mean, the kids were out there in the audience like this, cheering like it was the Super Bowl. You know, the red, the red sphere is advancing. No, the blue sphere has gotten in its way. And so, I mean, it was, it was, it was just great. Unfortunately, the spheres um, uh, they they have gotten old, and and we we celebrated uh, just about a month ago the the final spheres competition. The spheres will be coming back down uh, now. The Ames Research Lab has put up. Um, another, I, they're not exactly like the spheres, but they're, they're, they're called personal astronaut assistants. And uh, whether or not this sort of competition will be able to be continued with them, I don't know. But I hope so, because it's involved at this point thousands of students from all over the world. They're, you know, it started out as just a local competition, and then it became nationwide. And, and now we've had students from, from all over the world. So. Again, the, the thing that attracted the students, and, and I'll just say it once more before stopping, is give students a chance to feel like they can reach out and touch space, and you'll get their attention. And, you know, the idea that, gosh, I wrote a computer program, and it was loaded by an astronaut on the space station is incredible excitement. Linda. Thank you, Jeff. Linda? Oh, that was a good story. Um, it made me think about a couple of times in the recent years I've gotten to uh, be a judge at some of the U.S. First, which is not NASA, of course, but the cheering for something that was science and engineering related was kind of a thrill to see because, you know, we, we, if we can do more of that, I think that's a good thing. So uh, I guess a little bit on my origin story. I grew up in southeast Missouri, and there wasn't a very clear path to NASA from there. But, you know, I, I view NASA as having both a formal and informal education components, and certainly when it... In the early days, which is when I was growing up, we didn't have we didn't have any formal education outreach to the public, but just by the fact of its existence, and we were all glued to the set, you know, and watching the coverage. I mean, that for me was a lot of my stimulation. I think in science, um, and thinking about it, and and sometimes I wonder if even today, where one way they can't touch it quite directly, but there's so much now out on Instagram and and uh, Twitter and Facebook about what's going on in space, and you can, you know take that on a daily dose, but we're so deluged by so much coming in that I don't know if it's as intense as it was back when we were watching the early program where it was the big thing going on. And so in that way, it formally, uh, it was an informal education outreach, and it certainly influenced me and a lot of people. And I was in grad school at the University of Missouri, where I eventually, after 31 years here in Houston, went back to but when women were getting a chance to go into space and getting hired for the shuttle program. And I was able to do that because I took advantage of an educational path that I actually give, you know, in some convoluted way, NASA credit for inspiring in the first place. Um, so uh, in my shuttle flights here, we had, we had different educational outreach. I mean, um, one of the th things that we still have under a different acronym these days on station that I think is a really cool outreach is the amateur radio program. Um, because it, en it, en it enables people on Earth to talk directly to the astronauts, not going through uh, mission control or some other environment. And on my first flight, we had SARX, and we got to talk to students and people around the world. And I actually would like to give a nod here to Owen Garriott, who pioneered this on, we just lost him this year, and he pioneered that on STS-9. Um, and it's been a, a great education outreach ever since, and that was on, I think, three of my shuttle flights. But I particularly remember STS-37 because there aren't many firsts left in the program anymore, but we were the first all-ham crew, so we did talk to a lot of students around the world. Um, I also was involved in some of the early liftoff to learning programs here, and I hope that, you know, that the, I, I know that those were good tools for outreach to teachers and, and that reach students. Um, a lot of those were oriented toward younger students, and I think it's really important to target elementary and middle school because that's when they start forming the ideas of what is possible. And some of what NASA's outreach to me does in education is just saying this is possible for you to do. You know, don't feel like you're shut out because it seems like um, there's not a path. And so I am pleased that, though I understand it's, you know, budget is challenging now, but we had a strong education office for a very long time that, that helped through all the NASA centers to, to, um, you know, be part of this more formal inspiration for an interest in space and science. Um, oh, and one more thing I wanted to mention about the ham radio is 
Uh, well, after I left NASA, my career here, after quite a long time, uh, I did go back to the University of Missouri, and I became a professor there in the Department of Physics and Astronomy for eight years. I'm still doing that at about a tenth of an FTE, but it's a transition to that right now. Um, but fairly, which is a handful of years ago, I got to visit an elementary school there that was uh, talking to Mike Hopkins on the ham radio as he was on ISS. So I saw it from the other end, and they were so excited and thrilled, and they felt like they were touching space there. And there were parents there, as well as a community of volunteers who'd done a lot of work to set that up and make it happen. And so again, it's a huge effort to make these educational outreach things um, work. So I'm, um, you know, I hope I made a little bit of an impact in education outreach by going back and being in academia for a while. Uh, the funny thing was, although my early research was uh, in physics, low temperature solid state materials research, after working for NASA, they decided to put me in astrophysics, which you would find, Welcome of course, I'm using, and I, which, you know, <laughs> so I don't know about them, but my education certainly continued, because I worked pretty hard at that, but I ended up teaching uh, basically two kinds of classes, and one was a relatively large class of a couple hundred students over many, many semesters who were not interested, well, they were interested in science, it wasn't their major in trying to interest them in astronomy and space, and I would have students tell me, this is really hard for me because I don't do concepts, and I just thought, they just think they don't, because how do you get through lives without doing that, you know? And and you know, just trying to make kids think and not just memorize. And then I uh, taught a class for a while in physics and space exploration where we worked on projects about how you travel around the solar system and not just plug it into MATLAB. You know, how do you conceptually take the concepts and make it work? And I don't know, but I learned a whole lot after I left NASA. <laughs> you know, so all of our education continues, but I think all of us that work here take these skills back out to the public every day where we know it or not, whether you go back into academia, you're just, you're, you're, you're called for an interview. Um, and so all of us are ambassadors for education outreach. And I will also say that when I got a lot of interview requests, like we all did this year, for those of us that are old enough on the 50 year Apollo, I wish I'd taken notes 50 years ago to remember, because everybody says, how did that change my life? And I, I know it did, but I didn't write it down and my, my memory now is 50 years old. So just, you know, keep track of what you're doing. But I, I guess just leaving it that we're all informally involved in NASA outreach and education all the time. We're always, we come back here and we don't think about it because we're around people who are experts in all of this. But you get out in the rest of the world and you are the expert. So just Thank always you. kind of be on and Good think comments. about it. Uh, so uh, Elena. I will be speaking now as a uh, professor at the Graduate School of the IBMP, and I'm also a professor at the People's Friendship University, where I uh, do the course for space medicine for medical students. It is a very specific type of course. Usually, students from African countries and from Middle East come to study at that university. And those countries are not exactly involved with the ISS project at this time. So they take great interest in learning about that. So I, we, we even do role playing. They imagine themselves to be scientists and they, as if they run some types of experiments. They actually read our articles and uh, science that we've done. Then they start a, playing a game. They uh, interact as if they were scientists. They run mock conferences, and it's extremely fascinating. We do have a, a way to interest the young people, because now we have very specific goals for lunar exploration and going to Mars. While we were just on the lower Earth orbit, it was less, um, less uh, viable for us to get young people interest. Right now, the goals are so ambition, ambitious that uh, young people generate a lot of ideas. They get extremely excited. 
Also, medical students are more interested in uh, application of our results in medicine. Uh, we talked about the penguin suit. We talked about uh, rehab uh, ways. And even if those medical students never do space medicine per se, they still get a lot from those courses. And uh, they actually interact with the results and with the experience. And they do interact with the dream of people flying into space. Thank you very much. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm Kevin Fong. Um, I, I started out life uh, as an astrophysicist, actually. Um, I thought you had to be very, very clever to be a doctor and never go to medical school. But in my second year of physics, I lived with some medical students. And one night I came home and I looked at them all lolling around on the sofa. And I thought, <laughs> how hard can it possibly be? So, <laughs> so, so I went to medical school. Um, that career in science really had been driven by my childhood interests in, in the stories of Apollo. Now, I grew up slightly after. I, I, I wasn't born for Apollo 11, but I, so the first thing I remember was Apollo Soyuz test project and my parents showing me that. And the reason my parents showed me that um, as first-generation immigrants who had no higher education uh, and had English as a second language because they knew they had to drive me and my ambitions with some big idea and the only idea that was big enough was that and it was successful that's why I do what I do today um, I, I've continued that I, I worked out here as a visiting researcher with Bill Pulowski's uh, labs uh, and, and many of you here and I'm very grateful for that um, uh, I, I've come to realize that this is the important part of what we do is, is ensuring, as Mr. Abbey says, that, that, that we use these ideas of space exploration to drive future generations in the same way that I was driven. But it is also a circular thing. You need to have a supply of scientists and engineers for us to prosecute the future programs of space exploration. But you also need to get that message out and the message of what we're doing out to the public so the public care about it at a cultural level because if the public don't care about it at a cultural level it doesn't turn into votes and the government won't fund it and I know that I know that up close because 20 years ago uh, Jeff and Larry Young and Bill Pulowski were kind enough to come over to, to the UK to help me in my efforts to try and explain to uh, British government that they should re-engage in human space exploration uh, and they said to me, um, I know you're showing me a lot of statistics, but basically we care about what appears. Uh, we have a science broadcaster back home called Brian Cox. He's like our Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he said, we don't care about your statistics. We care about what Brian says in the newspaper in his column on the Saturday. That's what drives opinion. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a job to be done in education, but it goes more broadly than that. We have to tell the stories of the things that we do so that this becomes understood as culturally important, as, cu as culturally important as any other item we have from our history, our cathedrals, our pyramids, and all the rest of that stuff. And to do that takes great effort. Uh, yes, we need to be in the classroom. Yes, we need to be engaging in university programs that inspire our students. But we do need to go beyond that. And certainly in my slightly... Uh, 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 bizarre career path. I, I've sort of done all those things. I teach an undergraduate course in space medicine extreme environment physiology. That was the first course in the UK of its type. I've gone and done the schools talk thing. I've gone and done the public lectures. I even do some broadcasting. And actually, latterly, I, I've realized that the broadcasting is more important than we thought. And I'm just going to leave you today with an example of why and how that is important, what value it has. So. This year, with the 50th year of, of, of Apollo, I, I petitioned the BBC to make a long-form podcast series. Uh, and that's important, because this is a story that is understood by people of a certain age who are around and have memories of it. But there's the challenge of how do you repurpose that story so it's relevant to the through coming generation. And so, actually, it was really quite difficult. But the resources are enormous uh, within NASA and its archive, and the generosity of the people who allowed us to interview them. And we put together a 12-part series. Now, 
as a measure of, of, of how successful that was for us, our science channel, BBC4, if it gets 200,000 viewers for a science program, everyone's throwing cartwheels and throwing high fives. Um, our main channels, BBC2, which is where most of our main popular science appears, it's about a million people, and everyone's super happy if a million people watch that. Uh, in the United States, the finale, uh, the, the season finale of The Bachelor got 7.5 million viewers. Um, so so that's, that's sort of metrics by which you understand the success of a media, uh, a media output. 13 Minutes of the Moon, uh, which is 12 part, 12 times 45 minute podcast series has, has so far gone north of 5 million listeners and it's still going, it's still going. Um, and that, that was the podcast version. We also put it out on BBC World Service. BBC World Service reaches 50 to 70 million people worldwide. And it's not just quality, quantity, it is also quality. So the age group in that, 40% of the age group were under, under the age of 35. So we were hitting it all across the way. Now, I'll finish by saying that there are enormous resources in the stories that NASA and the other international space agencies can tell, but you've got to tell them. You've got to tell them, because if you don't tell them, no, no one knows. And so education is important, but engagement with the public is part of that education. And, and up until we made this series, BBC did not believe that this was a story that we could engage new generations with. They thought it was an old story, they thought it was 50 years old, and there was no one alive who was less than 55 years old who would be interested, and we proved them wrong. It is the most successful podcast series the BBC World Service has ever put out. So for those of you in the audience who I haven't got to yet with my broadcast ambitions, I will get to you. You just have to, you're gonna have to help me when I get there. So thank you very much, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Mike? Well, first, I want to set the record straight. Bonnie's program is one to be emulated, not competed with. So <laughs> I'm following in her footsteps and uh, really appreciate some of the help uh, through the years on things we've worked together. Um, I had a great opportunity when I was a young engineer. I got to work for Max Faget and C.C. Johnson uh, as after they left NASA and went into the commercial space industry. And as a result of that, on there'd be bad days where C.C. would say, Lembeck, not only is that idea stupid, you're stupid. And then he'd pull me aside and tell me why. And that was today, if I tried that, of course, I'd be taken down to the department head's office and escorted out the door. But it was those kind of interactions back in the day, I think, that brought home some of the unique engineering uh, topics for, for students like myself back then, and the importance of certain themes, and uh, particularly in reliability and, and you know, human spaceflight awareness, something we talk about today. And to answer Steve Robinson's questions from lunch today, um, we still teach that. I, as part of my capstone senior design course, one of the first things I have my students do is pull up a figure from Apollo history and give a short oral report about that person and what their importance was to the space program. And then we go from there into understanding what are the historical solutions that have been offered for human spaceflight and what kind of biases have now pervaded into our era. The things that we learned how to do, we don't go test out new things anymore. We kind of leave them in place. And so that's sort of a challenge we need to overcome in order to allow our students to become innovative and, and bring new solutions forward. Um, one of the greatest things we have at our, 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 our toolkit today uh, is what Jeff mentioned, CubeSats. Um, being able to go from Sputnik, a basketball-sized satellite, to the school buses that we've launched to GEO and beyond, uh, coming back today to the bread box satellite that are built in our lab by undergraduates and graduate students. It's a terrific hands-on capability and opportunity. And one of the challenges of that, of course, is dealing with student labor that comes in spurts. We have fall break, Christmas break, spring break, and yet we have to deal with the external realities of schedules of meeting up with NanoRax and NASA for a launch. And so dealing with that is kind of a management challenge for me and also a, a challenge to keep the students inspired and, and to develop a sense of responsibility to actually complete their work. Uh, they're there as a customer of the university getting education. Sometimes they don't feel the responsibility to actually finish something that we're responsible for. So we have to work through those things as well. We have some other challenges uh, as we're moving forward. Uh, most of my students today are teena were, were teenagers when the shuttle stopped flying. So they've never seen a space vehicle launch from the continental United States. And that's a challenge because they sometimes don't understand the metrics we now apply to engineering engineering systems. 
sometimes the job is more how many jobs are we creating? Uh, how are we keeping those jobs in certain states? And not is the system engineering efficient? And that's, that's a challenge to, to talk through. Um, a lot of the, the solutions today that our students are coming up with, we were mentioning at lunch machine learning and things like that. Well, a lot of those tools for explainability in machine intelligence systems are now coming to the forefront. And so it's going to be a challenge to see that these 20-year-olds that took us to the moon back many moons ago, pardon the pun, uh, get a chance to actually show their stuff today and get past the 40 and 50-year-olds that are stuck, in, and I don't mean to be offensive, but stuck in the ways of the past because we were biased and that stuff worked and we don't want to really challenge it. So we really need to move forward. We need to figure out how to get the TRL 2 and 3 work out of the universities and into the flight production systems. So that's sort of my challenge today. That's what I'm trying to achieve in, in moving education forward. And uh, I really appreciate opportunities to come here and interact with folks like the rest of you to get new ideas on how to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. And in the spirit of collaboration, let's work together. <laughs> okay. Salajan. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, currently, despite all the amazing achievements in space exploration, young people are not really that interested in um, space sciences and therefore uh, I would like to share what has been created at uh, Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center to get the young people interested in high technology. So despite the fact that uh, we are in the business of uh, training cosmonauts, uh, we have set up a separate program for youth and for school children. So we have created an educational center for school children. It is based uh, on mere orbital station uh, simulators. And if uh, you have been to the JCTC, you know what I'm talking about. This is a unique complex where every student can um, meet cosmonauts and receive all the knowledge that they want to receive in different areas. And of course, uh, we are providing career guidance for our youth who come there. We tell them uh, the history of space exploration. Of course, uh, we uh, teach them how it happened in Russia and in other countries. And uh, we have uh, great resources to uh, attract young people from different countries. We have special programs. Uh, and uh, special uh, programs for young people from uh, all over the world, and they're welcome to participate. Thank you very much, Salajan. Uh, Isabel? So I will be speaking about uh, the first theme, stimulating interest in science and engineering education by speaking a bit about uh, one of our important activities right now that expresses our approach uh, to, to this and have an impact. Um, the Canadian Space Agency has always been very active in education and outreach, and each project has always like um, a part of its activities or associated activities uh, in education and outreach. And uh, I hear the other panelists, and there are many ways uh, to educate and inspire and, and, and do uh, STEM or inspire STEM careers. Um, of course, uh, the space program in itself has a, we know, a very powerful attraction factor uh, to drive uh, youth into STEM careers. Um, so inspiration is one way, do exciting things. Uh, another way is um, to um, communicate information, so to communicate new knowledge. And another way is to have youth engaged. And we heard many examples of that as well. And being engaged, we believe, is, is very important. Uh, what's important is that um, beyond, uh, beyond being inspired, beyond uh, learning, uh, acquiring new knowledge, then it's to feel the challenge and it's to achieve the challenge that's also important in, in, um, in uh, inspiring youth to choose STEM careers. 
So as I mentioned yesterday during the Lunar Exploration Panel, Canada committed last winter to be part of a sustainable uh, lunar exploration program and uh, contribute to the Lunar Gateway. And of course, as I said, we always have an outreach and education aspect to every initiative. And this is a very long-term um, commitment, potentially. Uh, we've been, the space station is going to celebrate its 20, uh, 20th anniversary um, soon. So it's when we commit to being part of space station or to being part of lunar exploration, it's long-term. And we need to make sure that we prepare the next generation and we show them how they can tangibly contribute to those initiatives. So as part of that, we have an initiative, very important at national level, that's called Junior Astronauts. So I have to give the credit to my colleagues from the Canadian Space Agency because I'm not leading this initiative. Uh, my team contributed expertise to design the activities, uh, but uh, it's our communications and science and technology uh, sectors that are um, in charge of, of this initiative. So I have to give, the, give them credit for creating this. Um, so as part of our participation, we want to engage young Canadians and make them excited about future careers in the space field and how they can play a role in Canada's mission to the moon. So really, they can be part of it. We're targeting students that are between grade six, grade, grade six and nine because that's at that moment that they make important choices about the courses, the classes that they will pursue in, in science and math. They make those choices and to have the careers later than they have to to do the, the right classes. So that range of ages is very important. Um, and as part of this initiative, uh, we have um, three uh, main streams of activities. And again, they are all engaging activities and we want to see what it is like or what it takes to become an astronaut. So there is a stream in science and technology where we want them to, to create, innovate, have fun, use their imagination really to solve problems uh, related to a lunar lander mission, for example. So it's very tangible. It can involve also coding. Uh, there is a fitness and nutrition aspect, and we want to challenge uh, the young participants both physically and mentally and stimulate, uh, to stimulate the, the types of activities that astronauts uh, perform. And the third stream is teamwork and communication. So it, the activities uh, can be debates, uh, they can learn about voice protocols, for example. But again, we want to challenge them to communicate effectively and work together to accomplish their goals. So in those three streams, uh, we designed activities that are very accessible. So every student in Canada, any school can register to be part of that initiative. And the, the activities are curriculum friendly, so they integrate well with the, the school um, curriculum. They're free, uh, they're low cost to run for the schools. They're customizable, so they, choose to, they can choose to do part of them or just one or two or all of them. They are adaptable, so they can be adapted to various uh, ages, so even outside of the main range that is our focus. Um, and uh, they, uh, they are all linked to uh, astronaut missions. So they really reflect, and, and we, the, inspire, the inspiration for those activities was how we recruit astronauts and what astronauts do perform during, uh, the tasks that astronauts perform during uh, their missions. So we want to strengthen, uh, strengthen cross-curricular uh, competencies, but we want them to have fun. Uh, we want the activities to be highly interactive. Um, and of course, the objective, and that's important for the Canadian government uh, in general, not only for a space program, is to highlight the importance of healthy living and team building skills. Um, so the schools register, uh, they need to participate to at least one activity in one stream, so that's not too much. And then they uh, are registered for, uh, for a draw, and they can have the visit of an astronaut or an expert, a space expert uh, at, to the, at their school. And there is also a national contest. Uh, so if a, a student participates to all the three streams with at least one activity, then uh, uh, they also have to fill a questionnaire online, a little bit like if they were applying to, to become an astronaut, and provide a video explaining why they would be a, the best junior astronaut candidate. And then there's going to be a, a draw, and uh, the, the young uh, applicants 
uh, you know, they will be drawn, but uh, we want to have participants from every province and territory in Canada. Uh, so they're selected randomly, but then the ones that will be selected uh, through this process will take part in a, in a camp during summer 2020 at the Canadian Space Agency and work with scientists and engineers and train as astronauts train, uh, essentially. So that's one example of uh, a program that we're doing that's very open, uh, very inclusive, uh, that can be done pretty much anywhere with very little resources but that shows uh, the focus we place on engaging uh, youth in, in uh, very interactive, highly interactive activities. Thank you very much, Isabel. Mr. Robinson, Dr. Robinson. When I listen to programs like that, like Isabel was just talking about, <clears throat> I think, wouldn't that have been great if that had been <laughs> available at when we were that age? Um, and listening to Kevin and his amazing stories about broadcast, I, I, I was reminded that I have a background in broadcast, actually. My first job out of college with a double degree in aeronautic, aeronautical and uh, mechanical engineering was as a morning DJ on an FM radio station. My parents just loved that. And so every morning I got up early, and, and it was a brand new radio station, so we didn't really know. We, we wanted to survey, just like you were talking about, could have our impact and our reach. So one day we said, everybody had to call in. And um, 13 of them did. <laughs> so it was clear that I had to change careers. So I <laughs> have been at UC Davis in California near Sacramento for seven years. And uh, last week we announced um, a uh, campus um, initiative, a brand new Center for Space Flight uh, Research at UC Davis, first one in the U UC system. And um, research uh, grant funding is, is coming from NASA and NSF, and infrastructure fun funding coming from the campus itself. So hopefully you'll hear lots more about that in the future. Um, when I started there, only seven years ago, the student interest in space flight was something we felt like we had to promote. I felt like I had to promote. I had to, you know, there are lots of people interested in things that fly, but um, I teach a senior course in aerodynamics, and every time I teach it, I ask in the first day of class, if you had to do a senior design project, if you could choose between designing an airplane and designing a spacecraft, which would you choose? So when I started about seven years ago, about a quarter of the class said spacecraft, and uh, two weeks ago, when I, when I had the first day of class, um, probably more than two-thirds of the class said spacecraft. So the students, it's not so much a matter of getting the students excited. It's meeting their expectations of excitement now, keeping up with them. And frankly, I think commercial space has had a lot to do with that. It has brought the idea of inclusion and participation to the students in a way that we couldn't make happen ourselves. And so now our challenge is stay up, keep up with it, keep that, keep that flame alive. Show the students the kind of options and excitement that we all feel and we know because we've been in the, in the, in the industry and that's, we've chosen that as a career, but they're, they're, they're still learning. One of the things that I was amazed by, moving from NASA Johnson, I mentioned there at lunch, I had 37 years at NASA, but the last 17 were at JSC where the technical staff was very close to 50-50 gender mix, male, female. When I went to UC Davis, I found that our students were 17% female, the rest male. And I thought, this is really weird. This can't be good for anybody. And I still believe that. It's gotten a little better. better. It's up to about 20%. We brag about that. It's terrible. That's not something to brag about. Um, what can we do about it? So we, we do what we can. We, we, our lab has uh, instituted an outreach program called, called Aerospace STEM for Young Women. And just like Isabel said, we reach down to about the fifth grade and try to do outreach to fifth graders to try to not so much sell aerospace, but to say our dreams were about flying and going to space. Here's how we made our dreams come true. How can you make your dreams come true? We don't try to make it any, any more specific than that. Man, it's been growing. It's entirely voluntary by my students and the students um, in, in the department and across the campus, and it's been growing very rapidly. In fact, I'm trying to contain the growth so as not to harm the students' GPA <laughs> in their engineering school. Um, but it's been very successful, reaching out to 
um, a number of local schools of uh, disadvantaged children. So one of the things I find in spaceflight engineering, we all know that integration uh, is the key. It's a systems engineering problem. When we teach engineering, we don't really teach mostly that. We might have a little systems engineering in the projects. We might introduce it here and there. Some of us have a course in it. But I think the traditional American higher education um, construct really respects the divisions between the disciplines. And that doesn't do spaceflight any favors, especially since we uh, really neglect, I think up until recently, many of us have been trying, we neglect to mention the human being as an essential aspect of the engineer's training. So in engineering school, many of us got two, three, maybe more degrees in engineering, and nobody mentioned the human being. That certainly was true for me. And so now we're trying to, I think all of us here, and, and many of you too, are trying to bring that some knowledge, some, some, some appreciation for the human physiology, for the human neuro aspect, neuroplasticity, and also cognition, behavioral science. Those are very important to aerospace engineers. And so we're, that, that's a real challenge, I think, certainly to us in, in teaching those of, those of us with children and all of us in the industry to kind of uh, think about how we jump those divisions and truly think about integrating um, as we look forward to um, educating the next generation. Thank you, Steve. Well, as the, the audience thinks about questions that they would like to ask, I'm going to uh, circle back and ask a question and pivot off of prior panels, uh, and that relates back to inspiration. Uh, inspiration is a, uh, a pull rather than a push. I grew up on a ranch. My, my dad used to say, uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Uh, but if they get hooked and you see that light in their eyes, then they, they're inspired. Much of that inspiration, and I was, uh, I saw Sputnik, I admit it, Clear night skies out on the ranch. Red, Jules Verne, was inspired. But every night on TV and getting ready for Apollo, there was Walter Cronkite on all channels, worldwide. Landed on the moon, all nations saw it. So to be inspired, sometimes you have to see it or read it. And we came to a point in, in space flight where it was no longer shown on TV. In fact, my last, last launch in 1989, my mother was in her 80s, became so angry she called the TV station. And then when they cut off the broadcast at SRB SEP, she called them again. <laughs> and so for landing, they actually brought out a dish on a trailer and parked it outside the house in, in the Yakima Valley <laughs> so she could watch it. So the question is, you know, we all have a bandwidth. We can only reach so many people. You, you've got MOOCs, Jeff, and you can reach a lot, a lot of folks, but they're not the K-12 we go to classrooms and so forth. But that first part, that reaching the millions, like Kevin's talking about, how do we convince our media, our social media, just the local TV stations to really start to put more about space on there so that we can inspire and then recruit and then uh, cultivate all the way to education? Yeah, well, look, there, there's two things. First of all, if you're limiting yourself to the regular media channels, um, they're only going to put stuff on that's new and exciting. That, that's, why they, that's why Walter Cronkite did Apollo 11, but by the time you got to Apollo 13, it was no longer news. When we went up to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, it was on all the television networks. But the, you know, the subsequent Hubble missions, they weren't. But we're no longer limited to just a couple of commercial TV channels. So, I mean, anybody who is interested in space can, I mean, there's stuff all over the web. There's, um, you, you know, you look the JPL website after the something lands on Mars, they get millions of hits. So, uh, you know, the, the information is there. But if you're looking at, at how to make sure that it gets out on the normal media, there, there is only one answer, and that's do exciting things. If you do exciting things, they'll get covered. That's a really good point. My sister is a K-12 teacher, and she points out to me that 
since NASA, um, many of the resources were pulled back for sending out educational materials to classrooms and so forth, uh, it's purely passive. The teacher has to be able to go to the TV or the website. They don't have a computer in every classroom in this country. And so it's very inaccessible from their point of view. So that seems, we discussed this last year as well in our, in our working group, is how we as a, um, a body could might work pro more proactively with well, let's, let's say the, the TV industry, for example, or, and, and the radio industry to make it more prom, uh, uh, promotional. And I will give a plug for one of my graduate students who is also uh, a DJ <laughs> part-time. It's going to do something on space. But it's something to be thinking about. And maybe the audience has some questions or some comments on programs. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Kelly Graham, and I am currently an undergraduate at UH, so I am really close to having just made that decision to do pursue a space-related career. Um, like I was 12 when the last space shuttle mission flew, and I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you guys for being my inspiration for wanting to do this, um, because without you guys, uh, we... we I wouldn't have seen anything, I wouldn't have known about all of this space. Um, but I think something that maybe is underutilized is science fiction in terms of inspiration for us kids. Um, because all of the things that we see that are happening in real life from NASA and from SpaceX, they're fascinating and they're wild and I would love to learn more. But it was the magic school bus that made me like space. And Bill Nye the science guy, and even though that was still like grounded in reality. It's those fantastical things that make you think, oh, how can I be there too? That would maybe inspire kids like myself. Um, but I think another big challenge that uh, as a young person whose life is still far in the future and is kind of filled with uncertainty is that your generation is a generation that will be hiring mine. And something that is a little bit terrifying is to be told that, oh, suddenly our goals have changed from Mars to the moon and then back to Mars way in the distance again because my goal is Mars, but that's really far in the future. And to have these goals changing all the time and to maybe be told that the field of aerospace is small and that positions are really difficult to get, it is discouraging for a lot of me and my peers. and. I know, I have to tell, I have to justify myself by saying I know I'm not going to be as successful as my other engineering friends. Well, maybe um, one of the panelists can kind of comment on those, that's life, <laughs> and stay, stay ready. This is, uh, Steve. When I started with NASA, um, like before your parents were born, <laughs> thank you for speaking up, by the way. We, we, we need your voice. We need to hear from you. You're, you're educating us, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I started right in between um, Apollo and shuttle, and NASA was full of demoralized people because the Apollo program had been canceled before it was finished. That was horrible. The shuttle program had had its budget cut by 50%. And so everybody presumed that the other 50% was on the table too. It was on the table. And so having had this fantastic program canceled and the thing that we're working so hard to make happen, worrying that that was going to be canceled too, we had very much the same concern as you. Is that what are our goals? I think most of us realize, do you know what our goals are? We can't do any one of those things if we can't understand some of the basic aspects of how humans can survive the energy, energy, energy transfer of going into orbit and coming back safely. Now we're starting to talk about things that Mother Nature knows that humans don't know. Those are challenges that are bigger than any one destination. And it kind of comes back to your own heart, you know? If you can internalize things that are bigger than any single destination, then you can be flexible without having to change your whole mindset and your whole life goal. And I, I think that is uh, the, the basic goal, is build the foundation and then be qualified wherever you decide to go. Any other questions? Yeah, I'd like to add though, don't think of yourself as a kid. You're a young adult. 
And as such, you have to now start making the decisions about what's going to make you happy. And don't worry so much about the big picture stuff rolling around and changing, but identify with a company that is doing something that you like to do, that it's in your specialty, and then grow it from there. I think you'll find uh, job satisfaction comes that way. I, I still think of myself as a kid. Yes, so. yeah. Yeah. And I, I would echo what you said, science fiction definitely was a big inspiration for me, so I completely relate to that comment. It's true, it's very important as well, because it brings us even further than what we are currently doing or planning. Very important. And I would say that um, Chris and Phil often say something uh, that I find simple but very important. If you don't try your best or you don't, if you give up at any point, you have 100% of chances not succeeding and not making it. So you have to persevere and p follow your passion and believe that you can make a difference no matter what. Elena, you want to wrap it up with a last comment? I would also like to say that don't be afraid to do something. It's better to do something and regret it than not do something and then regret it. You have only one life. When you have a lot of children, when you have a family, husband, and you would realize that you could have chosen that path and you didn't choose it. So honestly, don't reach that point of no return. Try to do things. And at some point you will realize that if I don't do it now, I will never do it uh, at all. So. Try and do your best. Well, on that, what, take one more question, David. Oh. Oh. Hey guys, my name's Salvin. I'm a second year med student at Baylor, and I had a question about outreach. Um, so three years ago, I figured out I wanted to do aerospace medicine, and I spent hours on Google searching internships and things like that, and. One of the biggest challenges for me to secure an internship was um, finding them in the first place. Um, I know we have intern.nasa.gov. Those internships, there are hundreds of them, but NASA really tries to find someone who matches exactly what they want and someone who has the exact qualifications they want. Um, I ended up getting one because I had worked with flies for six months and I got into a fly lab at Ames, but I didn't want to work with flies. And the one internship that I, the one internship that I, that I really wanted was one that I actually found on Twitter because Jessica Mir tweeted about the Space Life Sciences training program at Ames the same time I was just looking at Twitter. And so I got lucky that way. I got lucky getting that internship. And I still think it's a challenge to reach out in the first place. Um, what I did was Google, and I just Googled aerospace medicine internship. I Googled space biology internship. I Googled NASA internship. And I found all these things, put them in an Excel document, and went from there and got rejected from more than 95% of them. So in terms of what you guys are doing in, in, uh, in outreach, are you, is there a better way to reach out to students? I know you have your podcast, but it was still difficult. But, but, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because I had exactly the same experience in 97 when I first came out and I did the aerospace medicine clerkship that there was no formal application process and basically the selection process for that was finding the program. Uh, and actually, I don't think that's a terrible thing. I, th I think actually, especially now with the resources available to people like yourself, then if you're that interested, you probably will find it, I think, I think. Um, uh, but that said, that's at that level, that's at the level of specific programs um, and opportunities. Uh, you know, I, I, I still do think that there is a huge job of work for us in this community to do to tell the, to tell our own stories, and that's what I've become convinced of. You know, uh, there is an enormous amount of material in NASA's archive. I'm sure it's the same for the other international partners, um, and it kind of sits there. Uh, we trawled hundreds of hours of oral history archive to make the podcast series, but but this stuff is out there. But we sort of, I think. As a community, we've expected that someone's going to kind of tell the story for us. Well, that's us. a really good point. I'm going to wrap on that because I'd like to invite the good suggestions. We want to take recommendations, good comments. When we have our education working group meeting a little bit later this afternoon, it's open to anyone that wants to come and help participate. So I want to be respectful of our next panel, and uh, thank you very much for your participation.